first uh, webinar for the Sustainable Solutions Web what, Workshop. Um, Diana's going to introduce uh, the workshop for us. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Diana Hammer. Um, I work for the Environmental Protection Agency in Region 8, and um, I'm in the Montana office. Before we start, Mary, is this session being recorded? Yes, so this session is being recorded. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mary Shad. I work with the Peaks to Prairies Pollution Prevention Information Center for EPA Region 8. We're located at Montana State University. And just very briefly, our role um, in this series is kind of a technical support role. So we're providing the access to the webinar software that allows us to put this on. And we will be recording each of these sessions and we will be posting those on our website, which is peakstoprairies.org. Um, and I will be sending out the link to that so that all of you can access uh, all of these recordings for the various sessions that we'll do, as well as any materials that Marie and Diana would like for us to post for you. We'll have those ready, uh, available for you online on our website. And again, I'll send the link to that. Um, the recording and the materials for this first session will be posted on um, our current website. And actually, between now and the April session, we will be launching a new website. So when that happens, we'll be sure to let you know uh, the new link for the page where you will access your materials. Uh, also, Myla Kelly, who is the program coordinator for Peaks to Prairies, is the one who will typically be on these webinars with you. Today, she's in Denver at a meeting at EPA Region 8 headquarters, and so I am filling in for her today, and I may do that again in the future if she needs me to, but if you need to contact either myself or Myla, about accessing the materials or about using the webinar software. Uh, if you send us an email at information at peaks to prairies.org, that comes to both of us and we'll be able to help you with that. Okay, thank you, Mary. Take it away, Diana. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, we'll just quickly go through the um, the agenda here. Um, my, uh, Mary just covered shop logistics. Um, we'll begin by introducing um, Marie and myself. We'll go through the goals and the syllabus, and then we'll talk a little bit about the team challenges and um, you, the participants. Um, and I'll just mention now about the in-person session. There'll be um, three days in. Um, at a location to be determined in Montana um, in August. Then we'll introduce, do an introduction to biomimicry, talk about the homework, and then leave some time for questions and answers. So hello, I'm Marie Sanowick Bourgeois. I'm a civil engineer with EPA Region 8. I've spent my entire career in the government. I spent four years on industrial wastewater treatment plant design and operation for the state of South Carolina. I worked as a Superfund program. And since then, I've always done um, pollution prevention and sustainability work. In 2010, I graduated as a certified biomimicry professional. And now I use biomimicry as a sustainability tool. My job at EPA is to help other federal agencies and government organizations develop and implement sustainability plans. And now I use biomimicry as a tool to do that. And I'm Diana Hammer. I also work for EPA Region 8. Um, I studied biology and environmental science in college, and then I went on and got a master's in public health. Um, and a couple of years ago, I took a workshop from Marie in biomimicry and got so excited about the topic and its potential or and its applications that I'm now pursuing a master's in bio uh, master's of science in biomimicry, and will graduate with that in the fall. I um, and I live in Helena, and um, I too used to be a um, Superfund project manager, um, and now work. I'm now working on more sustainable solutions, uh, like with this workshop and working with tribal government. So the goals of this workshop, as you saw in the application, um, are to create long-lasting and sustainable solutions. And we want. We'll be walking 
through uh, walking you through the biomimicry framework and drawing upon traditional ecological knowledge to kind of inform and enrich in the um, discussion. And ultimately, we through these this framework and this methodology, we can expand the solution space beyond maybe the what we would tra traditionally use to solve environmental challenges. Many of you may be um, well versed in using web-based tools. Um, some of you may, maybe not so much, so we'll have some more practice with that. And same goes with multidisciplinary teams. It's always um, a, a richer experience when you work with people from other disciplines. And when we look to nature for solutions and broaden our solution space, that, that works really well by drawing from engineers and biologists and business people and designers to um, solve problems. And ultimately, we're looking to nature for the inspiration. And this is a screen that should be familiar to you. Um, it was part of the application practice, our package. Uh, today is the first webinar, March 18th. And we will um, be working through six webinars, again, with an in-person session in August. Diana, I'm afraid that I don't think we're seeing that. We are seeing um, global.gotomeeting.com. Oh, okay. You should be seeing my PowerPoint slides. Let's see. Um, oh, it's paused. No one can see your screen. Click to start. Okay, can you see it now? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. Something no can. problem. Thanks for letting us know, Mary. Sure. Okay. Um, all right, so, so I'll just, there was a, I'll just, there's the agenda, picture of me and Marie, um, the workshop goals. Here's the um, syllabus from the application package. And here are the four challenges. So as part of the application practice, uh, package, we had a number of challenges, and these were, um, four that seem to really resonate with uh, the majority of you. So we formed the teams. Um, you should have all noted um, which team you're in. Um, the four challenges are how does nature collect, distribute, and store water with minimal energy use? How does nature manage disturbance? How does nature communicate? And how can those strategies help us communicate about sustainability? And finally, how does nature adapt to seasonal changes in precipitation uh, and drier conditions? So we have a really talented group. Um, we've got folks um, from the Fort Belknap Indian community, um, folks from the uh, Salish Kootenai College on the Flathead Reservation in Western Montana. We have folks from the Forest Service, EPA, the Park Service. We have environmental consultants, educators, landscape architects, designers, business people, biologists, and engineers. So what a great and talented group of people. And as we move through these workshops, we'll learn more about each of your unique and special talents that you bring to the workshop. So we're, I think Marie and I are both really excited about working with you. So here is a list of, um, all right, as, as she's showing the teams, the challenges, and the individual team members. And this will be included on the information that's posted on the MSU website, and it'll all, um, this will allow you to uh, communicate with your teammates as you work through your challenge. So now um, I'd like to shift gears and uh, take a step back and really think a little bit about our position in the world and our place on the Earth. So imagine for a minute that the planet's entire history is represented in a single calendar year. If that were true, in February, the first bacteria emerge from the primordial soup. Um, those would be our most ancient ancestors. In March, photosynthesis begins to oxygenate the planet. And for the whole summer, one-celled organisms rule. So after that summer, finally in September, sex bursts on the scenes and diversity of life explodes through greater exchange of genetic material. Then we move forward to December. So by mid-December, we've got fungi, plants, and insects 
are now on Earth joining the party along with amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and birds. This is mid-December. Just in time for the winter solstice, we have flowers, December 22nd. On December 25th, dinosaurs go extinct. And just 12 hours ago, human, our, our predecessors, hominids, arrive on the scene just 12 hours ago. And now, at 24 minutes to midnight, humans arrive. So we really haven't been on the Earth for very long. We are the young ones. And how we live in the next minute is going to determine our fate on Earth as a species. We'll be, will we be sturdy survivors or a failed and remarkably brief evolutionary experiment? So biomimicry is about listening to the 30 to 100 million species, these mentors that are found in nature. 99.9% .9 of all organisms on planet Earth have gone extinct. The 0.1% that exist now have something very special to teach us. So we are nature, and it's helpful to keep that in mind. We can protect the environment more effectively when we look to natural, the natural world for models and solutions to our environmental challenges. And the science of biomimicry can help us do that. And biomimicry is about unearthing these astonishing treasures from nature's recipe book and we can mimic these in our technologies and industrial practices. So we can look to nature as model. We can get design ideas from nature. We can look to nature as measure. So after 3.8 billion years of evolution, nature has figured out a lot of challenges. So what if we look to nature to figure out what works, what lasts, what's appropriate? And finally, we can look to nature as a mentor. It, this suggests that we can learn from nature and not just extract from nature. It's a new way of valuing the natural world. So with that, I will turn it over to Marie, and she can talk about nature's innovation. So if we want innovative solutions to our design challenges, where do we look for them? Well, actually, innovation is the oldest process on Earth. We live on a planet where life is subject to a state of dynamic non-equilibrium. The Earth is always changing, and only organisms that can adapt and evolve to those changes can survive. And we've seen this out west, where we've been um, We've had a lot of fires and floods to deal with. So humans create designs that are static. And when a disaster comes, they, they come apart. And so we need to learn how to adapt from nature. Because organisms on this planet have been conducting a development experiment for over 3.8 billion years. Organisms that are alive today are ones that have figured out how to thrive under the conditions of Earth. As we found already, humans have been around for only about 200,000 years, and the effect of the industrial revolution have been us, with us for only a few hundred years. So what if we looked at that 3.8 billion years of R&D? And what if we embraced that wisdom? Because organisms and ecosystems face the same challenges that we do as humans, but they have figured out how to weigh a way to live within the operating conditions of the planet and still survive. So we talk about biomimicry. We say it's the conscious emulation of nature's genius. And by conscious, we mean that we actively seek answers from the natural world, much like the native cultures did in the past. Emulation means that we don't just copy what nature looks like, but we look, we try to uncover the deep design principles in nature and bring those to our ideas. And nature's genius recognizes that the 3.8 billion years of research and development has a lot that could tell us about our needs on this planet. So when Janine Benyos first explained biomimicry to a stranger, it was not at a talk or a workshop, but in a big box store just after the book Biomimicry had been released in the late 1990s. 
She was looking for her book and checked out the nature section, the environmental section, design and engineering, but she couldn't find it. So she asked the bookseller where the book might be shelved. He came back with a perfectly normal but impossible question. What is it about? Janine tried to explain. It's about looking to nature for inspiration to new inventions. It's learning to live gracefully on this planet by consciously emulating life's genius. And she finally said it's really not technology or biology. It's the technology of biology. The shopkeeper, shopkeeper lift, lifted his palms as if weighing two packages and said something Janine would never forget. Look, lady, you've got nature and you've got technology. Just choose one. He was referring to the category schemes in the store, but Janine realized that the deep separation between the two ideas in our culture was why biomimicry really needed to be born. So biomimicry is a shift from learning about nature to learning from nature to decide a new way to live. Once, when asked what, what she was doing with biomimicry, Janine replied, I'm waking Sleeping Beauty. Humans used to have a connection to the natural world, and many native cultures still have this knowledge as part of their way of living on the planet. So in looking at biomimicry, we need to recognize and understand the Earth's operating conditions. This is a little lesson in Biology 101. So one of Earth's operating conditions is that everything on the planet is subject to gravity. Organisms either figure out how to use gravity to their advantage or how to overcome gra gravity, such as flight. All of Earth's organisms get their energy directly or indirectly from sunlight, except humans. And all chemistry in nature uses water as the solvent. So 99.9% .9 of organisms must live within these conditions, so we must as well. Another Earth's operating condition is that life on Earth is subject to cyclical processes. And the predictability of these cyclical processes helps organisms fit in. Okay. Things right. like the rise and fall of the sun, the tidal pools, or the seasons. We also know that Earth is subject to limits and boundaries. The little blue dot on the globe on the left is all the water that's on our entire planet. So it's all the, the clouds, the seas, the oceans, the glaciers, everything. So you can see that it's not very much. The little pink dot on the globe on the right is all of our atmosphere. So we need to honor and recognize these limits and boundaries and able to fit in on the planet. So in biomimicry, we can mimic the forms in nature, we can mimic the processes, and we can mimic the ecosystem. And in biomimicry, we try to do all three for the ultimate sustainable solution. A lot of people use Velcro as an example of biomimicry. And Velcro was invented based on the barbs that you see under the form uh, on the slide. Those uh, barbs from seed pods, um, the a gentleman was walking through the forest and he noticed the hook and loop kind of structure that allowed those seed pods to adhere and disconnect from his pant legs. And thus Velcro was born. So in that case, Velcro was a product that was mimicking the form in nature. But Velcro does not mimic the process or the ecosystem. Velcro is manufactured using what we call a heat feed and treat system with high energy demands and a lot of chemical use. And when Velcro no longer has its useful life, it's put in a landfill. It does not go back to become part of an ecosystem. So in the Sustainable Solutions Workshop, we are uh, attempting to include ideas uh, form, process, and ecosystem to solve our problems. So let's get let's uh, go through a few examples of where biomimicry has already been successfully applied. All right, thanks, Marie. So here's a, a question: How does nature cool with low energy? And in this example before you, uh, where look, the building at the right is called the Eastgate Building, and it's an example of using biomimicry in architecture. The Eastgate buildings 
located in Harare, Zimbabwe, and they have year-round temperatures in the 80s and 90s, high 90s degrees. Yet this building is designed using um, inspiration from termites to create a building that has no conventional air conditioning yet maintains a comfortable working and living environment year-round. And so how, how did um, the architect, uh, his name is Mick per Pierce, um, how did he do that? Uh, he worked with a, an engineering firm, um, a, um, ARUP, engineer, um, engineering firm, and they figured out the um, engineering strategies of the termites. And so in the picture at the left is a termite mound, a um, very common site in Africa. And the termites use a series of ventilation tunnels. And the engineers figured out how to mimic the engineering, the heating, or not the heating, but the cooling system and the ventilation structure of the termite mound and incorporate that into the Eastgate building. And it's a, it's a really famous um, biomimicry example, which achieves 90% energy reduction. So this, a building of the similar size would use 90% more energy than this one. And they estimate that in the first five years of operation, this building saves over $3.5 million in energy costs. So this, and this was achieved by looking to nature um, for, to answer this question, how does nature cool with low energy? Another example is the um, Shinkansen, or formerly known as the bullet train um, from Japan. And so here we're looking at how does nature move between substances without disturbance? And for those of you who might remember when the bullet train originally came out, the, um, there was kind of a significant problem with that when the train would enter, a, come out of a tunnel, it would create the sonic boom, which was really a problem. And Japanese engineer, uh, one of the Japanese engineers was an avid birder. He knew a lot about owls' flight and how silent they are. And one day when he was out birding, he was observed this kingfisher diving into a pool of water. And so going from a less dense media air into a more dense media water, similar to the tunnel um, and the air in the countryside, um, he noticed that the bird could enter the water without creating a disturbance. Like can picture sort of an Olympic diver with um, perfect 10 um, dive. So he, he thought about this and he's like, how, what is it about the aerodynamics of the kingfisher beak? And so he went back with his team of engineers, they did some uh, mock-ups and they ended up redesigning the nose of the bullet train to mimic the aerodynamics of the kingfisher beak. And that resulted in um, increased speed for the train. They had less drag, so less friction, so they could go faster using, uh, go about 10% faster with about a 15% fuel savings, and that removed the problem of the sonic boom. So all this was possible by looking to nature for a solution. Uh, and JR, JR West was the engineering firm. Another example, um, we hear a lot of talk about carbon dioxide, um, but it, and as a problem, looking to carbon, um, sequestering carbon dioxide and um, reducing our emissions. But imagine if CO2 was a resource. So, and that's exactly how life on Earth has evolved to act. Every plant uses CO2 as a building block. Photosynthesis takes water, carbon dioxide, and sunlight to make sugars, turns into leaf, leaves, turns into wood. So what if our building materials could use carbon dioxide as a fundamental part of their construction? And so the company Calera has looked to coral reefs. So coral reefs are built out of calcium carbonate. And, and how, what if we, so Calera looked to coral reefs to figure out how we could use CO2 as a resource, as a construction material. And so they took a bio-inspired approach following the concepts of how biological organisms like reefs turn CO2 and ions like calcium or magnesium into calcium carbonate. And by create, creating calcium carbonate and cement through this process, rather than heating limestone, the way humans create cement is a very carbon intensive process. We heat limestone to 20, over 2,600 degrees Fahrenheit and um, create a lot of CO2 emissions. Calera has flipped that on its head by using CO2 as a resource. So it, 
Clara estimates that for every ton of cement produced, half a ton of CO2 is sequestered. And then just two more um, quick examples. So humans, just like nature, need strong materials. Um, so how does nature create those strong materials? We see here um, on the right is a close-up of the spinnerets of a spider and then a spider on its web. And some of humans' strongest materials are Kevlar um, or steel. And they take enormous amounts of heat and pressure to create. We um, To create Kevlar, we heat. Um, the materials to 750 degrees Celsius, and and in the process of producing these strong materials, we create toxic waste as a byproduct. Yet ounce for ounce, spider silk is as strong is stronger than Kevlar or steel. So how does how do spiders do this? Um, what could we learn from how spiders produce its silk? Because it creates the silk at ambient temperatures temperatures and pressures in its body and using dead flies and water as materials. So we really have a lot to learn about manufacturing. And then the final example, um, this is a close-up of a bird's eye. And you may know that um, birds crashing into windows um, is a worldwide problem. Over 100 million birds die every year by, um, in the US alone. So worldwide, I'm not sure that total, but um, it's an enormous number of birds that die every year by crashing into windows. So researchers at the Max Planck Institute for Ornithology wanted to solve this problem, and they thought about how birds fly through a forest and they avoid spider webs, and they thought about how um, birds see, um, about bird vision, and birds are able to see UV, um, UV light, and humans can't. So they partnered with a company called um, Arnold Glass and to create a, a window pane that looks just like this one on the screen. And this is how humans see it. But this is how birds see it. They embedded it with these UV fibers that are visible to birds. So that when the birds see the window pane, it doesn't look like something they can fly through. It looks like um, something that they should avoid. And so this, um, they've created a product called Ornilex Glass, which has re greatly reduced the number of bird collisions. So in tests, 90% um, of the birds were able to um, choose, the, choose to avoid the Ornilex Glass. So that's it's really quite a remarkable um, change in technology. So I'll turn it back over to Marie. Thanks, Diana. So, the biomimicry framework gives us a different way to look at a problem. So traditionally, when we're being asked to design a product or a process, we're, being, we're given what we want to design. For example, we're given a task to design an air conditioner. So if we're a sustainable-minded person, we would go out and we would design an air conditioning unit, and we would find one that was uh, low energy, maybe made out of recycled materials but we would still be um, looking for an air conditioning unit. Now in biomimicry, we change this, what the question we ask. So we say what we really want to do is we want a solution that regulates temperature. Now there's no organism in nature that builds an air conditioning unit, but there's every organism on the planet needs to regulate temperature in some way. So by asking a verb in our question, how does nature regulate temperature, we can uh, look to nature for those solutions. Now as an example, here's a zebra. And many people don't know why a zebra is black and white stripes. They're a master at regulating temperature and use the stripes in order to do that. So underneath the black lines in a zebra are the sweat glands. And when light hits a dark substance, it absorbs the light. So the zebra, the sunlight hits the zebra, it absorbs the light, and, it, and the animal sweats. When light hits a white area, it reflects. And the small amount of air current that is developed across the skin of the zebra between reflecting and absorbing light creates an air current. And with the sweat glands, it's there a walking swamp cooler. So we can look at nature by asking the question in a different way. And that's what we're going to be doing in helping you solve your challenges. 
Now when we want to make strategic choices, we can look at the problem from many different angles. We can do incremental changes. Now if we do an incremental change, we have a short investment in research and development. This would be something like deciding to put LED light bulbs in your building to reduce your energy use. Not much research and development needed. You just go to Home Depot, buy the LEDs, and install it. And you, but you get a low level of um, sustainability. If we redesign our building, let's say we, just, we, we want more light, so we add solar panels or we put in more windows. It takes a longer investment in research and development to do that, and we get a higher level of um, sustainability. But if we rethink how we look at a solution, we can get a highest level of sustainability. And that's what we'll be doing in this workshop. We're going to be rethinking uh, those challenges that you've identified. So biomimicry strives to emulate the general patterns and processes that are found in nature. And we refer to these as life principles. And so what life's principles are, they're all the principles that every organism on the planet follows, except for humans, or those organisms have gone extinct. So we use life's principles as a way to evaluate the solutions that we come up with. And um, sustainable solutions really meet all of life's principles. So we'll have a separate class just on life's principles because they're so important. But one of the most important things that we can do when we want to apply nature's ideas to our solutions is that as humans, we need to quiet our cleverness. Because we're not the oldest or the, the most wise organisms on the planet. And if we're able to quiet our cleverness and listen to what nature has to tell us, much like native cultures did in the past, we can come up with those sustainable ideas. Diana? All right. So um, as I mentioned in the beginning, Marie conducted a similar workshop in 2012, and I was a participant. And um, I was so intrigued by the whole um, concept of looking to nature for, to develop sustainable solutions that I've um, pursued um, this emerging discipline. And, um, yeah, and as I mentioned, I'm getting a master's in, in biomimicry. So in 2012, we um, set up, similar to this, um, we set up some challenges. We had four teams. And one of the challenges, um, actually two of the challenge, challenges are similar to the ones that you have selected. They seem to resonate with people really well. And the results of the um, workshop teams are posted on the Peaks to Prairie um, website, so you can look at the results. But just briefly, um, the challenge of how does nature collect, use, distribute, and store water with minim minimal energy use. That's being applied to a project in along the northern plains um, for dry land grain farmers uh, through a grant at Montana State University. So that is that the work that that team came up with is, is in use. The team um, looking at how does nature develop communities that thrive, that initially was, we thought the problem was, I was on that team, and we thought the problem was really about communication. And as Marie uh, mentioned, really need to carefully define the question um, and carefully define your verb. Um, it wasn't about communication, how does nature communicate, so much as how does nature develop communities that thrive. And the work um, from that challenge, the, the challenge results, is used, being used by the Grand Canyon National Park to engage more of the park employees in the sustainability program um, by developing a more cohesive community. How does nature organize? Think of an ant colony or a beehive. Um, so the, the results of this team's work is being used by the Forest Service to develop a sustainable operations program that can adapt and evolve over time. And it also allows for locally attuned solutions, so a system that will also fit in not only to the, the area where they're located, but into their bureaucratic structure. And then finally, how does nature adapt to changes in climate? Um, this is similar to the um, challenge that the uh, climate change team will be looking at um, using the place of the Fort Belknap Reservation in northern Montana. Um, how does nature adapt to flood, fire, and drought? And this is being used by Boulder County Parks 
to assist in connecting citizens to organisms in their community and also in helping the local government um, develop climate change adaptation plans. <clears throat> so that was the 2012 workshop. So on to this workshop. Um, so for the homework for March, um, we have three parts to the homework. First, um, you'll need to meet with your group. Um, we've got the four challenge teams um, depicted here. And just to get things going, we've assigned one person as the leader for this first assignment. You can choose to have a leader for the remainder or not. It's up to you as in your team. But you'll need to meet, decide on a team name, and then how, when you're going to meet to do your homework. It um, seems to work best if you have kind of a standard regular meeting time. And we'll expect that you'll probably need to meet twice um, between now and our um, April 15th webinar to complete your homework. And again, all this, the contact information is posted um, on the Peaks to Prairie website. So the first part is to form your team. Um, here's some ideas of how you might connect, um, you know, Skype, Adobe Connect, or um, conference calls, whatever seems to work. And you probably will need to meet twice um, between now and April. Um, one session to discuss the assignment and assign roles, and then again to bring regroup, discuss what you've come up with, and finalize the assignment. And then you'll have to assess whether or not you need more, more sessions. But uh, that should do it. Um, the second part of the homework is some, are some readings about viewing nature, including a primer um, written by Janine Benyus um, about biomimicry. And then the other reading is connecting with nature. And again, that'll be posted on the Peaks to Prairie website. And the third part. Um, and you don't have to be an artist to do this. I'm not an artist, and I really enjoy this. It's called an eyesight, um, and it's about observing nature. And our, our ability to learn and, um, and find nature's mentors really depends on our observational skills. And so this, these eyesight, each month we'll have an eyesight exercise. And the more you do this, the more adept you'll become at observation. And so there, there, there are more detailed instructions about how to, about the homework um, posted on the website. But basically, you'll select an eyesight, a place that's easy to get to, maybe somewhere in your backyard or a, a local park or someplace quiet where you can observe nature. And then we recommend that you keep a journal um, to sketch. You can write. Um, you can use words. You can use colored pencils. You can whatever medium um, you're most comfortable with. And over. If you can do this every day, it would be ideal. And you know, at different times of the day, and if you pursue this, and even observing at different times of the year can be really um, instructive. And so draw and record using all of your senses, senses and plan to spend maybe 20 to 30 minutes just sitting there quietly observing. Um, you don't need to draw the, or write the whole time, but sit there for a while and observe and before you start writing or drawing. So for the March eyesight exercise, I want you to start looking at what kind of patterns you see, what relationships, what are some adaptations, behavioral or physiological, that you might see in response to the biotic or abiotic conditions and pressures. And what gradients do you see? Do you see boundaries? Do you see edges? So all this is detailed in the homework. So with that, um, I think I have plenty of time for questions. Okay, so we're um, wrapping this up a little early with our presentation, about 15 minutes for questions. So I'm going to unmute um, everyone. If you have a question, um, would you just uh, speak up or else type it in the chat box. as an emergency. <laughs> so does anybody have any questions about um, biomimicry, about any of the examples, or what you're expected to do as teams in this um, workshop? This is Barbara Benoit in Region 8 um, in the Denver office. I'm on the Peaks to Prairies website. Is there a an uh, indicator of where we go? Because it doesn't um, immediately just jump out at me 
P2 network, directory library. Okay, hey, Barbara. Mary, would you Sure. Actually, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, this is the old Peaks to Prairies website, and I've been with Peaks to Prairies for three years, and I'm so excited to finally <laughs> have this website in our queue for the next thing to renovate. Um, but for right now, these can be found when you go over to the sidebar on the left side of the page. It says webinars, and actually the 2012 biomimicry workshop series. Um, you can I hate see. to say I don't have that. <laughs> oh, okay. Let me try to guide you to that. So if you go to peakstoprairies.org. Right. Okay. I found it now. It okay. Was a different, a different initial page. So I went to home and found it. Okay. Great. Thank you. Sure. Do you mind just sending a link to that page um, to the group? Yes. So that's exactly what I'll do once this. Uh, once today's recording and any materials that you would like for me to post are posted, I'll be sending a link to the group to point people directly to that page. Great. Thanks. Okay, thanks. And what we sent to Mary this morning was the biomimicry primer, the homework for the March webinar, which is due uh, one slide about your team and what you've decided to do in your meeting and introducing yourself, um, along with the reading connection with nature and the PDF of the slides that we presented today will all be uploaded to that site. Um, it says if there's any way to do a quick introduction of team members. So let's do that. Okay, um, I'll just call out your name and you want to introduce yourself. Barbara Benoy. Hi, this is Barbara Benoy. I am um, in the Brownfields program. I have a background of toxicology and chemistry. I've been with EPA for 29 years, and I've done a lot of things, but primarily super fun chemical um, emergency response and uh, economic redevelopment. Great. Welcome, Barbara. How about Jessica Dunn? You're on mute. Want to unmute yourself? Jessica? Hello? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, hi. I'm Jessica Dunn. I'm a landscape architect in um, the southwestern region of the Forest Service. I'm located in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I've done a lot of work with our sustainable ops program, um, which, as was mentioned, used the um, nature as a model. And I'm also the project manager for the development of a best practices guide for sustainable design um, that will be used nationally for recreation design at the site scale. Great, thanks. But Elliot, are you able to speak, Elliot? I don't hear Elliot. Elliot is a student at the University of Colorado, and he has formed the CU um, Environmental uh, Biomimicry Club. So we're working. Uh, his group is working on the. Biomimicry Food Challenge, in addition to taking this course. Ina, Ness Pierce. Don't hear Ina. Oh, I, I'll just chime in. Ina is the Environmental Director for the Fort Belknap Reservation in Northern um, Arizona. And she put together a team from Fort Thompson, mm -hmm. representatives from the uh, Tribal College. And Jim, can you speak up? It looks like people who are not on have a hard time speaking up. Can you speak up, Jim? Do you have a microphone to your computer? So Jim Evanoff um, was previously the environmental manager for Yellowstone National Park. He's worked on a wide range of environmental issues, and we welcome him and his expertise to the group. Kate? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Great. Um, so my name is Kate Gregory. I work for EPA, the Region 8 office in Denver. I've been with EPA for about seven years, and I've worked in environmental management systems, the Energy Star program, focusing on energy efficiency in the built environment, 
and also pollution prevention as the administrator of the P2 grants in the region. Okay, welcome, Kate. Kendra, I don't know if you can uh, speak up. You're not listed as having a microphone. Kendra? I don't think we can hear from Kendra. Yeah, it does look like people who are on the web only are having trouble okay. speaking. Um, Kendra is an engineer um, in, from Colorado. Um, Emily Lang is with the U.S. Forest Service. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, yes, my name is Emily Lang and I am a forest wildlife biologist with the Sequoia National Forest in the central Sierra Nevadas of California. And a few weeks ago I took on a detail with sustainable operations in the Forest Service as the utility bill cleanup lead. So I'm looking forward to um, working with my group. Great, thanks Emily. Well, thank you. Lynn Chan. Hi, yes, Lynn Chan, landscape architect, Yellowstone National Park, also sustainability program here. Hi, Marie. Hi, Lynn. So glad to see you. So Lynn's from Yellowstone National Park. Um, Martin Ogle, you're on mute. Can you unmute you yourself and introduce yourself? I'm on the phone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Hello? Yes, we can hear you, Martin. Okay. Uh, I'm actually on a phone, and that's the only way I've been able to listen. But if you can hear me, this is Martin Ogle, and uh, I am in Louisville, Colorado, in uh, Boulder County. And I used to be a park manager naturalist in northern Virginia for 27 years, and I've now started my own consulting and education business here. Thanks, Martin. Welcome. Uh, Matt, um, can you speak up? You're on the computer. Maybe not. So I know Matt. He's a recent graduate from the University of Colorado in mechanical engineering, and he helped found the CU Biomimicry Club, and he works um, bringing nature's ideas um, to the to his all of his in mechanical inventions. Very innovative guy. Uh, Jane, Michelle. Um, Hi, this is Jane Michaud. I'm with EPA Office of Research and Development, and I've uh, been with EPA 21 years and currently working on in a program that's the Sustainable and Healthy Communities Research Program. Um, I'm very interested in, in um, what I'll be doing now and for the rest of my working life um, in connecting nature and children and education, and so this is this course is really interesting to me, and I'm interested in learning how how you use this to communicate and, and teach. Thanks, Jane. Mike, uh, you're also, can you hear, can you speak up? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, Mike from the Mescalero Apache Reservation. I'm here with uh, about eight uh, people, all our staff. Half of them are Mescalero tribal members, and the other half are AmeriCorps volunteers. And we're going to be working together on, although we basic business is operate a fish hatchery, we have started a big uh, agricultural initiative, and we're very interested in seeing how this will all play together. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, Peter, can you speak up today? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, hi, this is Peter Corsoni. Um, I have a background in electrical engineering and I spent many years working in the energy efficiency field doing technology evaluations. Uh, and I also have a, a kind of a long time interest in nature observation and have participated in various um, classes and whatnot um, for that, and yeah, I just I spend a lot of time in nature, and I'm fascinated by the whole mimicry concept. So I'm uh, glad to be part of the, the the team here. Thanks, Peter. We're welcome. And Tom, how about you? Can you speak up today? 
Can you hear me? Yep, we sure can. Hello? Yes, yes Tom. Okay. <laughs> Tom Quinn. Yes. Um, and I'm actually a lawyer and uh, elected official in Lakewood, Colorado. I've been involved in a number, directly involved in a number of sustainability initiatives here at the city on waste, recycling, uh, public health, open space, uh, and a number of other issues. And I'm also president of the board of the Rooney Road Recycling Center Foundation uh, in Jefferson County, um, former legal chairman for the Rocky Mountain chapter of the Sierra Club. And I've uh, been involved in a number of things that really excited uh, because I don't have as technical of a background as some of the folks in the group. I'll be very interesting to learn from you. I'm really looking forward to it. And thanks, Tom. We need all kinds of disciplines uh, in this group, so we appreciate participation. Diana? Are you looking for me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, yeah. Yes. Oh, hi. Um, hi, everyone, especially hi to my group members. Um, I have my background is um, actually in marketing and international business, um, but I'm running um, the largest AmeriCorps program in the state of Georgia, uh, where we're focusing on educating those that are in urban areas on sustainability and the importance of science and mathematics. So that's really been more so my passion on creating healthy and sustainable communities and using education as a tool um, to make sure that we can kind of help the children uh, reconceptualize what sustainability looks like. Um, so I'm extremely interested. Um, I've been working on a couple of initiatives in the Atlanta area. That's where I'm based. Um, right now I'm out of the country, um, but I am definitely um, excited about starting and learning from everybody and contributing to the group. Well, thank you for taking the time to call in. Welcome. Wendy? Can you hear me? Hi, I'm Wendy Weaver. I'm in Bozeman, Montana, and my background is civil engineering and sustainability. I've done a lot of, worked on a new, number of different initiatives across the state and in the Bozeman area. Um, recently been heavily involved with the Lieutenant Governor's Office on Green Schools Initiative, and we're trying to uh, work with U.S. Green Building Council to get our first lead certified school in the state. So uh, that's kind of my focus recently, but I'm really excited to be involved with this and looking forward to meeting my team. So, Well, thanks, Wendy. And I'm glad we had time today to um, introduce everybody. Uh, you'll also have another opportunity next uh, month in April to present some information about your team as a whole. So um, that's the uh, information we had to present today. If anybody has any questions or comments, um, if, when you send out the group email, could you include what cities folks are based out of? We can um, we can update the um, the table with um, with locations. Uh, actually, to the extent um, you provided it in your application material, I'm just thinking back, looking at them. I'm not sure we everyone did indicate. But to the extent we have them, we will put that in. And if not, maybe we can collect that later. OK. Any other questions or comments? Anyone who right. would like to well, stay. Well, thanks, everyone. Oh, <laughs> sorry. This is Mary. Anyone who would like to stay on the line and troubleshoot an audio issue with me would be more than welcome to do so. If you don't have time for that right now but would like to troubleshoot that at a later time, feel free to send me an email at information at peaks to prairies .org. Thanks, Mary, and thanks uh, for recording this. So we'll end the meeting, and if people want to stay on, if they have an a audio, uh, please stay on. If not, you're welcome to end um, the, the call. And thanks a lot. See you next month. Okay.